Hey guys, and welcome to the Moms and Murder podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my friend, Melissa. Aww, <laughs> Hi, thank Melissa. You. That seemed genuine and sincere. I appreciate that. Uh, I just, it's been a long day. I don't have it in me to be snarky with you this this evening. So I will keep that in mind and I'll let you know if you do. <laughs> we are so happy to be back. It's been a crazy whirlwind couple of weeks with the holidays and with our last episode having Josh Mankiewicz on and we are really excited, at least I am, to just be back kind of in our regular groove and having a regular yeah. case that we're going to do just like normal for us. And we love the Josh Mankiewicz episode. Yes. Well, we we loved it, but we will never listen to it again because I get <laughs> such extreme anxiety even thinking about that day. Very recording. hard on the nerves. Yeah, very, very hard on the nerves. So I'll maybe never recover from that episode. <laughs> maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. As long as I don't listen to it again, I think I can just put it behind me. And, <laughs> and that's just a thing that we did now. So. Yeah. It's a thing we did. It's a memory. Okay. But if you haven't listened to it, listen to it. Cause it was a lot of, we got a lot of good feedback on it, which we was did. nice. Yeah. So thank you guys. So we have our mugs to go to Addie, our winner from our Hardy Boys versus Dateline episode with Josh, and it's super cute. Can't wait to get it out for you. And we got that through our website, our Threadless site, um, momsandmurder.threadless.com. Uh, we have updated our logo to include the word podcast, guys, so you're no longer in a cult. Yes. Now we officially have the word podcast as part of the design, and it looks really great. So um, so if you want to check that out, um, momsandmurder.threadless.com, we would appreciate that. And we are looking forward to this new episode Mandy, hit me with it. All right. But don't hit me. (laughs) (laughs) So today's story begins in a small, quiet town with a population of about 9,000, Grimes, Iowa. It was the early summer of 2014, and Angie Verhul was in her mid-20s working as a school teacher. She was totally smitten with her fiancé of eight months, Justin Michael, who was 30 years old and employed by Wells Fargo as an operations analyst. By all accounts, Justin was the kind of guy anyone would be glad to have in their life in really any way. He was many things to many people. He grew up loving the outdoors and had a thrill-seeking side that led to activities such as skydiving, which he convinced his new fiance Angie, to do with him despite her fear of heights. What a guy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't what a know. girl. <laughs> yeah. I don't know many people who could convince me to jump out of a plane. <laughs> I've jumped out of a plane. And you I, have? Yeah, yeah. I went skydiving whenever I turned 18. That makes me really surprised. What? I'm not I, scared of, like, those kind of things at all. Like, regular life stuff I'm terrified <laughs> of. <Yeah. laughs> that makes no sense. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm, yeah. I'm an anomaly. So the couple was enamored with each other from the moment they met, and they became engaged in August of 2013, which was just two months after they had began dating. So that's a little fast, but sometimes that works out that way. Yeah. Uh, so a few months later, Angie would actually move in with Justin, and the two would begin planning their dream wedding, which they had decided would be on July 20th, 2014, and they were going to have the wedding on the beach in North Carolina where Justin's parents lived. On Mother's Day weekend 2014, Justin's parents came to visit the couple in Grimes. It was about two months before the wedding date, and the Save the Day cards have gone out, the excitement was building, and they were super excited to have his mom with them. Justin's mother recalled how they had spent that Wednesday evening before Mother's Day just hanging out, making s'mores, and talking about Halloween costumes. Justin's father was actually away on business in Minneapolis that night, so his mother stayed alone in the guest bedroom at Justin and Angie's home. In the middle of the night, Justin's mother, Marie, was awakened by the sound of her bedroom door opening. At first, she thought it might have been Angie entering the room to get something out of the dresser, but she soon realized that the shadowy figure standing in the doorway pointing a red laser light at her was much larger than Angie or Justin, and she knew that there had to be an intruder in the home. That is... That's worst case scenario. Like, any game of life you play... Somebody coming into your room in the middle of the night. Well, I terrifying. I just remember even when I was younger, I, I still kind of do every now and then. It's very rare, but I, you know, whenever you're having like a dream and you kind of feel like it might be like reality. Yeah, yeah. And it's I've had those dreams though where everything is black in my dream, but I can like sense that somebody is there with me in the um, room. That's not normal. <laughs> oh, it's normal. It's a recurring it's nightmare that oh. I have. But this reminds me of that, except real life. You yeah. know, so I get and I'm like terrified of that dream, so I cannot imagine. Kind of knowing, like realizing, like actually, someone yeah. is in the house or yeah. someone is standing in the doorway that doesn't belong here, you know, and and shining this laser light at me. Um, and, and she did say that she thought that was strange. Of course, 
you have to remember it's three o'clock in the morning. So yeah, you're disoriented completely. Exactly. You're very groggy out of it. You're not really thinking clear thoughts right. like you would normally. And so she didn't know what it was. She thought that it was a flashlight is what yeah. she said. She thought somebody was just like that. Angie was in the room with some kind of a strange flashlight looking yeah. for something. We have bears at our house, as you know, and you're terrified of, and they'll knock things over in the middle of the night. And when I hear them in the middle of the night, my brain tells me they could break into the house. Like your brain's just not really working at three o'clock in the morning. So you can make up a whole lot of scenarios and Angie with a strange light makes a lot of sense at three o'clock in the morning. Well, I think honestly that the thought of somebody uh, coming into your house in the middle of the night while you're sleeping is really legitimately one of my like most... I don't know. Like, it, it's, it's terrifying. Yeah. I have those kind of thoughts in the middle of the night. Like, somebody breaks in right now. What am I going to do? <laughs> right. Well, that's why I always worry. I'm like, would I wake up? Would I, you know, yeah. would I be able to, like, realize what's going on yeah. quick enough to do anything about it? And so it kind of sounds like, though, that Marie, Justin's mother, was, she didn't really know what to do. She was yeah. just kind of paralyzed Which with is fear. Which probably better. <laughs> right. Honestly. Right. Because you have to think, like, if I get up and start making sudden movements, like, that's not yeah. going to go if well either. they're leaving me alone, I should just stay here. Right. So across the hall, Angie was rustled from her sleep by the same sounds of someone opening her bedroom door. But being that it was three o'clock in the morning, she didn't fully wake up. The next thing that she remembers is hearing four loud pops, which startled her awake completely. And she looked around the room just in time to see a person running out of her bedroom. She was only able to see what she describes as a shadowy figure. No real features, of course, because it was dark. So she couldn't like say if it was a a white person a black person you know what color hair they had eyes right. and she couldn't give any features because it's a dark room so you just don't see anything and they were in, wearing all black um so she started to nudge justin started saying his name trying to wake him up just like anyone would do <laughs> something startles you awake in the middle right. of the night like that and he did not respond at all so she immediately became panicked and just knew that the worst had happened and she ended up turning on the light and I guess realized that her husband had been shot. And so of course, you know, she screams and Marie hears the scream from across the hall. And right. at this point, Marie had already been aware that there was somebody in the house. Yeah. So at that point, even Marie was like, Oh my gosh, like something really bad has happened. Yeah. And you know, we need to get, get the police here. So Angie ran from the room and dialed nine one one. In a Dateline interview that she gave, she recalled how difficult it was to physically hold the phone and dial 911 when you're in a panic yeah. and that she had to try three times before she actually was able to get through. So I know kind of about that. I've never had like a really, you know, I've never had to dial 911 for like a, a situation like this. Right. But um, there was like one time I had to dial because my son at the time, he was 13 months old, but he like fell backwards and hit his head and yeah. kind of acted like he was going to start losing consciousness. And I was freaking out. Of course, he was so small then, you know, and I really was really, really concerned. And, um, that was kind of the, my same experience trying to just dial 911 and it's like everything that can go wrong with a yeah. phone goes wrong yeah. at that time. Like, you it's know, like taking all your focus and you still can't like. Right. Get your fingers to where they need right. to be. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Or then it's just like whatever, like, oh, you're out of the service area or something's wrong. You yeah, know, yeah. it just, in any other call you would make would just go through just fine, except right. when you're trying to do something like except that. Except when you have an emergency. Yeah, right. So at the same time that Angie was dialing 911, Justin's mom was also calling 911. And we, they played the 911 tapes in the dateline. So something. That I, you know, it's really hard not to judge because sometimes when you hear 911 calls, you want to make a split second judgment about yeah. what, how that person felt or didn't feel or if they're being appropriate, you right. know, are they upset enough or. You base it on how you think you would feel. Exactly. Even though you don't know. Right. And like it's the middle of the night. I'm sure they're all very confused. Nobody knows what's going on here. Right. So the calls, to be honest, they did sound a little bit calm. Oh, they were very calm. It was very matter of fact, but. It has to be shock, just total It's just shock. shock, and you're just trying to get the call in yeah. and get the help that you need and, and and then figure it all out. Right. But it was very calm and just very um, – someone came in and shot my fiancé in the head, and they wanted her to go check to see if he had any signs of life, and she right. she just said, no, he's dead. Yeah. And so it was – like, that part of it, I was like, whoa, you yeah. know, um, not judging her, like, at all, but I was kind of taken aback by that myself, and I can see how, to a detective, that might look a little – Yeah. 
detached. Right, right. Is that the right word? Detached. Yeah. Well, the mom too. I thought her. She sounded very. Well, she was detached. even uh, well, the way she said it. Like some someone came in and shot someone. That's yeah. what she said. And yeah. they were like, "Well, do you know who was shot?" And she was like, "Yeah, my son." Yeah. And it's like, okay, that's kind of you. It's kind of odd to me that you wouldn't lead in with that. Yeah. Like my shot. Right. My son, son has shot. been shot. Yeah. Um, but like we said, we don't know how. Exactly. But I think what I gathered from anything I saw with her, she was very calm and just kind of... Just as a person. As a person. Like, her personality was not somebody that excited maybe ever. <laughs> like, <laughs> she just didn't seem like she had Some that Some people are just that way. Yeah. Officers arrived at the home to find a puzzling crime scene. They had many questions, including some practical ones, such as why would somebody come into this house, target one person to execute, and then just leave? Why didn't they kill Angie and Marie, especially since they, like, see that they're in the house? Right. There was no sign of robbery or forced entry. The only things out of place in the home were a DVD player pulled out in the living room and a neon yellow sweatshirt was left on the floor in the same area. Investigators found all of these circumstances suspicious. And, yeah, the it didn't make sense. Like, who goes into a house, shoots somebody, and leaves a sweatshirt? Right. Like, and the when only, did you take it off? <laughs> and the only thing that was, un, that was disturbed was just... It was like a DVD player. It was on the TV stand, had just been pulled out, and yeah. it was kind of like hanging on the floor, but the cords are still attached and everything. But that was literally the only thing yeah. that was out of place at all. I could do that at night, like just randomly. That, my like, kids do that know, several times day. a day. <laughs> like That would not be an abnormal thing at my house. If anything happened in my house and they said, like, here's all these disturbances that happened, I'd be like, I don't actually know who did that. <laughs> it could be anyone in this house. So officers asked Angie and Marie to collect their things so they could be taken out of the house. And I remember hearing Angie saying, like, crying and saying she couldn't see because she couldn't even go back inside to get her glasses. Like, they just rushed them out. They watched as officers combed the scene and searched for the intruder who had just murdered an important person in their lives. Eventually, they took both women to the sheriff's office for interviews. So they actually stayed there, though, for about three hours, is what Marie said in her Dateline interview, was that they stayed there at the house, I guess, outside of the house. But right. they stayed there for hours waiting before they actually took them into the police station and yeah. I, Marie had said that that was the longest three hours of her life. I, I was surprised by that. I was like, dang, they couldn't take like get you guys more comfortable. You know, yeah, that seems kind of torturous after what like, they have just been through. And well, and you know, he's not at the hospital or anything because, you know, you, that always is like a fishy area if somebody's going to the hospital and they bring them quickly. But normally you do. It seems like you hear about them quickly going to the sheriff's office like you think they would want to take them out of that situation. Right. Looking for a last minute holiday gift? Need your personal gift that's easy to create and even easier on your bank account? Then check out our friends at createphotocalendars.com. Createphotocalendars.com offers the perfect solution with their high-quality personalized calendars. In just minutes, you can create beautiful calendars using photos from your computer, your phone, or your Instagram account. They have a variety of page layouts and background designs to make your calendar unique. You can add birthdays and personal events, which the website will save to make it easier to purchase a calendar every year. The best part is that most orders print and ship within 48 hours. To create your own calendar, visit www.createphotocalendars.com and use the exclusive code PODCAST at checkout to get up to 55% off. 30 minutes after the murder of Justin Michael, an off-duty police officer came upon a traffic incident about five and a half miles from the crime scene. A car had gone off the road and into a ditch, appearing to have missed a sharp curve. The officer was then approached by a man who knocked on his window, and this man was acting strangely. He was out of breath. He was acting nervous, just just acting really odd, but right. otherwise didn't appear to be doing anything wrong, just that he was, he was acting strange. Um, he told the officer that he had had an accident and needed a ride, but the off-duty officer was not comfortable with that, and he called for backup. So he actually called like the dispatch and got an on-duty police officer for that area right. to come out. And to help this guy. Um, so I feel like that really says a lot about your demeanor. If a police officer is like, I'm not giving you a ride anywhere. <laughs> no way. <laughs> not you. <laughs> so the man who was 
turned out his name was David Moffat, was eventually sent on his way in a taxi despite his odd behavior, and his wrecked vehicle was impounded by the police. So this is an important thing to keep in mind as we move forward on the story. Back at the sheriff's office, Angie was being questioned by investigators trying to piece together what had happened. At some point, it became clear that the police were suspicious of Angie and the story that she was telling. So it's just kind of one of those... If you watch the interviews, which they did play, like clips of, or, you right. know, it kind of goes, I feel like you see this a lot where it's like at some point the person realizes that they're a suspect. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I can't imagine after, after what had just happened right. with her, that would be the, I feel like that would just be the most devastating experience yeah. to have to like realize like, oh, they think I have something to do with this. Yeah. You know, and especially if you don't. Yeah, then that's what I was going to say. Especially, like, she knows that somebody came in, so why on earth would they think that she had anything to do with it? Right. The on-call detective that morning found it strange that Angie would have been laying just inches away from her fiancé as he was shot, yet she had not one single mark on her, not even blood spatter. Uh, they began asking her questions about whether she, ha- she and Justin had ever used or sold drugs, whether they had... Possibly maybe whether she was seeing another man on the side and, you know, maybe that would have given some insight or a motive for why she would want Justin dead. And they just kind of came up with a lot of wild ideas that they questioned her about and to try to get to the bottom of it. So they actually started asking her a lot of questions about her past relationships. They wanted to know who she dated before Justin and how long those relationships were, what the extent of them was. So Angie told detectives that she had been married before and divorced, but that there was the end of that relationship was amicable. There was nothing, you know, nothing to it. They didn't have any kids. They didn't own property together. They didn't have anything that would make it like a messy situation. So they ended their marriage on what I guess you would call good terms as good as you can whenever you're getting divorced. (laughs) Um, So she then goes on to tell the detectives about, Another man that she dated right before Justin, and uh, his name was Andy Wegener. Angie had gotten pretty serious with Andy, and they had lived together for about three years, and she continued to live with them, with him, even after they had broken up, which, <laughs> no thank I you. I don't know how, I don't know how. You yeah. Could, I don't know how you could do that. I guess, what, do you just move to, like, the spare bedroom, and you're just yeah. hanging out there? I mean, yeah. Hey, pal. I know it's hard because moving is expensive and it's hard to like just pack up your life and move yeah. on a whim, especially if you've lived there for three years. Like it's, yeah. you have your whole life there in that house. Well, and you probably, they're probably renting, which means you're both, you could both be on that lease and you don't want anybody to screw that up. That just seems really awkward. No fun. No bueno. No. <laughs> but she said the relationship was also well in the past by the time she met Justin. She began telling detectives about some strange instances that had recently occurred, such as her vehicle being vandalized with windows busted out while it was parked in front of Justin's house in November of 2013, and also that someone had come to Justin's backyard and destroyed some fruit trees that he was growing back there. The detective interviewing Angie thought this was a red flag and that it didn't add up. He felt that this was very personal and began to press Angie for more information. So the thing about the fruit trees I thought was an odd thing to vandalize. Right. Like, where would you get that idea from? I guess. To just go and, like, cut the branches. Um, Angie said that they cut the branches off the trees, and eventually that ended up making them die because, of course, plants need their leaves and their branches and stuff to collect all their things they collect. All of the things. Oh, dear God. You know, the sunlight and the the whatever else. Nope, that's not helping. I don't know a whole lot about fruit trees. What? No, you don't? Based on this description? Actually, just kidding. I do have, like, some fruit trees, but I don't really do much with them. They kind of just sustain themselves. I'm going to go vandalize them. (laughs) Please don't. So as they were continuing to talk to Angie more about her past relationships and try to get more information. She had told them that there really was not very many men that she'd had in her life. Well, I wasn't surprised by that because she was only in her mid twenties. So how many relationships can you have had by that point? Um, So they continued to press Angie for information about her past relationships, which she said there were very few of, but about three hours into the interview, she suddenly recalled that there was another person that she had briefly dated in between Andy and Justin. And his name was Dave, but she claimed to not be able to remember this person's last name. So, I mean, I guess I don't know how long ago at this point that it was that they she had been with Dave, but she couldn't remember his last name. Well, the officer that was interviewing her didn't really think that was a likely story, I guess. And he was like, "Okay, yeah, sure. You know, and she was 
kind of even watching the interview tapes of her trying to remember Dave's last name, yeah. it kind of did feel like a little bit fake to me. Yeah, like, yeah. I was like, okay. Like, Dave is a very generic name, you know. Right, and oh, okay, now you don't know his last name, like. But truth be told, under pressure, I couldn't remember my own last name, so. No, 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 no. <laughs> to me, I was I know. like, I get it. <laughs> I know. So she told the detective that she had begun seeing Dave the weekend after she and Andy broke up, but that it was never really a serious thing. Um, she had met him at a bar and they mostly had a texting relationship. You know, they didn't even talk on the phone, which no one does anymore. So yeah. that's nothing serious. Um, but it was just really casual. She said they might hang out once a week or so. They would usually just go meet up at a bar somewhere and just like have a fun night or, you know, whatever. And then they would just text a little bit throughout the week. But it was not like a serious. It wasn't a relationship. It was not a relationship. No. Um, but then when she met Justin, she started to avoid Dave. And after her second date with Justin, she really realized that she liked uh, Justin a lot and that she wanted to pursue that relationship instead of this Dave relationship. So she was kind of concerned about how she was going to break this news to Dave. And she asked her friends, you know, what should I do? Should I go meet him in person and do this? Or should I send him a breakup text? You know, how should I do it? And her friends encouraged her to just do this through texting because that's been their entire relationship anyway. So, you know, why? It's new. Right. So just, there's no reason to go into this big, let's go out to dinner and I can break the news that I, Well, it wasn't a real relationship. It was just kind of a, like they both needed somebody to hang out with and talk to. So that, yeah. So a text I think was appropriate. So she was really kind about it and told him that, you know, in the interest of being upfront with him and she didn't want to lie to him, that uh, she had met somebody else that she really wanted to spend her time with. So he did not take that very well. Right. He sent her a few really nasty messages. She says that he called her names and said mean things about her as a person. And he just wouldn't really take no for an answer. And so eventually she just kind of stopped responding because, you know, you know how it is. Sometimes she goes, she goes. Sometimes you just have to do that though, because there's some people who just won't quit. Yeah. yeah. You know, and you'll, and it's never going to be a productive conversation. Right. There's nothing you can do. So then the very next day, he sent her another text message, and he was saying that he didn't feel the relationship was over, and he wanted another chance. And, you know, on one hand, it's like, I kind of feel bad for the guy. If he really was into her, I can kind of see how he's like, you know, the next day yeah. is like, but you can't really do that after you, like, the previous day just called someone terrible names. Yeah. You yeah, know, like, you like, can't then be like, actually, I'm sorry, you know, yeah. like, I want to really like you, and I want another chance. Yeah. <laughs> like, this like, is going to go real well. Right. <laughs> Pretend I didn't do any of that. No, thanks. So Angie did not respond to that message on the next day. And she says that she never spoke to him again after that. And that he never tried to contact her again. She never saw him again or spoke to him again. And then, of course, she went on to pursue this relationship with Justin, which was successful and they got engaged. And And it was very escalated. It went, moved very, very quickly. Right. Well, they got it. They were engaged two months after they met. So, yeah. So there wasn't really a lot of time, you know, there in between. So detectives were really invested in finding out just who this Dave guy was, and they started really focusing on getting his last name out of Angie and trying to help her remember and so that they could find him and, and at least talk to him or, you know, check him out, do a background, whatever. So after about 30 minutes of questioning just about Dave, Angie finally pipes up and says, oh yeah, I remember Dave's last name now. It's Dave Moffat. Dave Moffat was an accountant and the son of a wealthy Iowan farm family. Angie told detectives that one strange coincidence about Dave was that he had gotten a job at the same Wells Fargo branch where Justin worked a few months prior and that they worked in the same cubicle. What are the odds of that? Yeah, that's creepy. Yeah, it is weird. And even like Marie, you know, and and Justin's dad too, they were saying the odds are not really high that you would get a job – Not only in the same branch, but working. I mean, it was like a big, a large building. And so to get to work that closely together with as many people in the town, like they just, it's not very, it wouldn't be a common thing to have happen. So while detectives worked to find information on Dave, they ran a background check on him to find out whether he had a weapons permit. When another officer saw the name, they told investigators on the case about the car accident that had happened shortly after the murder and that the vehicle impounded belonged to a man named da, da, da. David Moffat. <laughs> what are the odds? Yeah, lots of coincidence. It's... Oh, I hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I'm like, shut up, boss. Shut up. 
This piqued their interest in a big way, and they had a strong suspicion that the murder and the accident were connected. A team of searchers returned to the site of the accident to look for anything that may be evidence in the murder, and they found some incriminating but very confusing pieces of evidence. They did. Um, near the crash site, they found two magazines of ammunition matching the brand that was used in the murder of Justin Michael, and they also located some paper shooting targets, some shooting like ear protection, earmuffs, and they located a shoebox that had a Amazon Kindle inside of it. And there was also a receipt that was made out to Andrew Wegener, which was Angie's other former boyfriend. Right. So the receipt was from a local car dealership for the purchase of three oil changes. And this is all in Andrew's name. And this is all so confusing to me. And like my main question too, that I really want an answer to is who buys three oil changes at the same time? That has really bugged me since I heard about that part. I'm like, what did you have? Does he have three cars? Did he just like prepay in advance for like a bunch of oil changes? Prepaid. Oh, to live that life of prepaid. I know that's not what's important here, but I mean, (laughs) who buys three oil changes at at one time? I just thought that was (laughs) not important. (laughs) Interesting. But interesting. So, but the question remained, how were Dave and Andy connected to each other and how were either one of them connected to the murder or were they, or is this all just a big weird coincidence or what's going on here? So this was all, of course, really confusing to detectives and they kind of went down like a rabbit hole of trying to figure out, you know, is this like a conspiracy? Was there Andy and Dave teaming up to get some kind of revenge on Angie? Like what's exactly going on? Right. So the detectives immediately went to Andrew's place of employment and they brought him in for questioning. And he had told them he had no hard feelings toward Angie whatsoever. He had only met Justin one time at like a party where they had like a lot of mutual friends. And he claimed that he had not really spoken to Angie beyond uh, one time she had sent him a a text message saying happy birthday. Right. So, but other than that, they were friendly with each other. It's not like they were, had any ill will. They lived with each other for a long time. And at this point, Andy Wegner is dating someone else so he doesn't care about angie and justin he has his own thing going on right the detective began asking andy about the receipt for the oil changes and shockingly none of the questions were why did you get three of them (laughs) question number one why did you do this (laughs) um and andy actually believed when they mentioned this receipt andy believed that he was in possession of the receipt so the date on the receipt was actually in march and at this point it's in may so that's actually a long time to keep track of a receipt although i guess if you prepaid then you would have to well, yeah, that's true. So, oh, but, that makes sense. You know, so he told them that he believed that the receipt for those oil changes that he had bought way back in March, which can you imagine? I would be so confused. Like, why are you asking me yeah. about something like that? That was months ago, you yeah. know, and how does that have anything to do yeah. with anything? So um, he told the detective that he thought he had the receipt either in his car or in his home or something. Well, then the detective started saying like, well, how would you explain it if I told you that that receipt turned up somewhere else? Yeah. And he was just, poor guy was so confused. He was yeah like well I mean like maybe like I threw it away like he was like what like what are you talking about you know so that was um an interesting little interview to watch because you could tell he was genuinely confused and had no clue why he was even there well how terrifying if your life somehow depended on this one receipt (laughs) right and you're like you're like well I think I have it I don't know and you like don't know you don't know what they're getting at so you're like where are you give me a little more information (laughs) I can really try and think about this So police obtained a search warrant for David Moffat's house. They recovered some strange notes, including detailed information about Justin and Angie's neighbors, such as when they were home, when they turned their lights off at night, which was the same type of weapon used in the murder. But it was made out once again to Andy Wegener, not David Moffat, whose house they were actually in. So So what's going on? Right. So this just gets more and more bizarre. Yeah. It became a priority to find out who actually purchased that weapon, and they went straight to the source listed on the bill of sale. It was an English teacher and my personal hero named Drew Ballman. He's the coolest guy. Right? (laughs) I know. Self-described nerd, avid target shooter, and metal detector enthusiast. It's a thing. Yeah. (laughs) My sister and I were at the park the other day, and we saw somebody with a metal detector, and their shirt said, Beach better have my money. Oh, I love that. (laughs) (laughs) I wanted to take a picture, but I was like, he'll clearly know what I'm doing here. 
Um, he told detectives that he had sold the gun to fund the purchase of a new metal detector, which he said was like six hundred dollars. Right, and <laughs> oh, my husband used to have a metal detector. And uh, this was a Keith Morrison Dateline. Yeah, and Keith was very confused on why he would spend six hundred dollars <laughs> on a metal detector. And then this lovely, lovely man, Drew, was like, "Oh, that's like the low end. Yeah, like yeah. you can actually get some that are like thousands of dollars." Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so he was. The six hundred was a splurge for him, but he was he made it very clear that that was not the top yeah. end of metal detectors. Exactly. Hey guys, as you know, I'm someone who loves knowing a little about everything. I love the news. I love entertainment. I love it all. But sometimes I don't have enough time to get all the information, all the little details, and the minutia of everyday news because, my goodness, it's constantly going. But thanks to the Newsworthy Podcast, I can get all I need in little bite-sized pieces. So if the stress of the news is getting you down but you still want to know what's going on in things like the election, check out the Newsworthy. And in these 10-minute episodes, they're just on-the-go listening. I can listen to it quickly on a walk, on my way bringing my kids to or from school or one of their activities. When I'm in line at the grocery store, there's never a wrong time to listen to the newsworthy. But if you feel bogged down by the news and kind of the negativity of it, but you still want to be informed on what's going on, the newsworthy is the place to do it. Erica at the newsworthy is an independent journalist and her team does really all the hard work and research for you. I love that the episodes are so well-rounded and there will be fun stuff like tech or big stories, but the way Erica gives this, you know, efficient and neutral overview of the news and in just 10 minutes each weekday, it's it's perfect. Just search The Newsworthy in your podcast app or go to thenewsworthy.com to start listening. Again, search for the podcast The Newsworthy, two words, The Newsworthy, to make staying informed easier and more enjoyable every weekday. It's been a while since I've had a baby of my own and some days I miss it so much. The baby cuddles and baby smiles, but when it comes to diaper rashes, not so much. I remember the first time my oldest had a diaper rash, I was really devastated. Here's this tiny thing totally dependent on me and now she's fussy and obviously uncomfortable and I'm supposed to have the answers. Well, with time and treatment, it went away, but what I really wanted was to avoid it altogether. And now baby butts rejoice. New Huggies Skin Essentials are here, a brand new dermatologist approved line of diapers, wipes, and pull-ups training pants, all designed with baby's sensitive skin in mind. The wipes are thick and have zero harsh ingredients for a great gentle clean. Pull-Up Skin Essentials has got your big kid covered too, with a training pant that's ultra soft and breathable to help protect sensitive skin throughout potty training. Whether you're a first-time parent or a seasoned pro, make it easy on yourself and your baby with Huggies. Learn more at Huggies.com. Once again, head to Huggies.com to learn more. It was about a month after Drew had listed the gun for sale on armslist.com that he finally got an email from someone interested in purchasing it for the price of $360. Drew responded that he would need a photo ID and a cash payment because Drew is awesome. Right. <laughs> he was able to produce copies of the email exchanges to detectives on the case. So the email inquiry had come from the email address andywegener47 at gmail.com. And Drew was presented with a photo ID for Andrew Wegener when he sold the gun to the person he sold it to. And the transaction actually took place in the parking lot of the gas station where Drew, I guess, worked Works, at. Yeah. Part-time little job there. So he just met um, who he thought was Andrew Wegener. He, that's who he was believed he was meeting, met him there in the parking lot, just kind of did the deal out of the back of his trunk. And, you know, he said that the guy he sold the gun to did, he seemed really friendly, really nice. And he just asked how to load the gun. And so Drew showed him and then he went on his way and everything was fine. And there was nothing abnormal about that whole right. transaction. And Drew was like a very much a Melissa with wanting everything to be done just down to the detail hey, correctly. That is not me. <laughs> I I'm, think I'm a paranoid person. That's you're paranoid. The part about me I think if true. you were selling a gun, you would probably go to all oh. these great lengths of making sure that every like finger I was dotted mm -hmm. and T was crossed. Like you're definitely going to make sure blood test. It'd right. be a whole thing. Right. So Drew kept all of the correspondence as well as the pictures that he had posted of the gun online, and he even wrote down the license plate number of the vehicle that Andy air quotes showed up in. That's me. Yeah, <laughs> just for funsies, just write it all down. Yeah. Um, 
So a few days later, Drew's boss notified him that a sheriff needed to speak to him right away. And Drew became immediately worried that he had done something wrong with the gun sale. Like he made some kind of mistake and something was not done legally. And he was just sure that he was going to jail for selling a weapon illegally or incorrectly, which that would be you. You'd be panicking. Yeah, I'd be panicked every time I got a phone call. (laughs) So detectives informed him that they believe that the gun was used in a murder and Drew was he was in shock. Um, they asked him if he had any of the shell casings from the gun that he had sold so that they could compare them to the ones found at the murder site as well as the ones they found at the crash site. And he did. He had a bunch. He, uh, he, it was like close to 100 empty shell casings. He had the officers were even like, this is a person who keeps everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so they were a perfect match. And uh, that was great. You know, it confirmed that that most likely was the murder weapon. Right. But they still didn't know who bought it or right. how it got into the hands of the murderer who ended up at Justin Michael's house. Detectives asked Drew if he thought he could identify the purchaser in a lineup, and they showed him two sets of six photos. In the first set, they included a photo of David Moffat, and Drew said that he couldn't be sure, but he believed that was the man he sold the gun to. The second set of photos included Andrew Wegener. Drew picked him right out, but this time he said that Andy looked like the guy in the ID. So he recognized both men out of the 12 that he was shown, but David Moffat was who he believed he met in person, and Andy was the person's ID that he was shown. This dude has a good memory, too, because... I would never... I would forget your face as soon as you leave. Right. I would be like, it could have been either one of them. Honestly, I don't know. They both look familiar, but I wouldn't be able to say this was the ID. This was the real no, person. So I, I, yeah, no good I'd memory. Maybe on everything. Right. Maybe. <laughs> Although he obviously was the kind of person who paid attention to detail because sure. because he's Drew. Right. <laughs> Detectives brought David in for questioning, but he requested a lawyer immediately and refused to talk. It didn't matter though, because they had enough evidence to charge him in the murder without getting an interview. They showed Angie a photo of David Moffat to ask if she knew who it was, and she confirmed that it was the same Dave she had mentioned earlier. So at this point, they realize that they have, they've got him. They've got enough of a connection there where they can say, most likely this guy, you know, is the killer. Uh, So as detectives began executing search warrants on Dave Moffat's home and building their case against him, they found a red storage tub containing a treasure trove of evidence. This was what they would call a gold mine for, yeah. uh, you know, detectives searching for this type of thing. So the shoebox that was from the crash site that they had found the Amazon Kindle and the receipt in, um, that didn't have, it didn't contain the shoes that the box was for. Right. But in the inside of the red tub there was a brand of shoes uh the brand was nevado and so that was the same box you know the same type of box and so they found the shoes that probably came with that box you know inside this red tub that was all confusing everything i just i know (laughs) so they also found in the bin some ammunition that matched the uh, murder ammunition and a laptop at the very bottom of the bin well it was they there was also water in the bottom of the bin a few inches so this laptop was submerged in water well that's not suspicious is it no (laughs) i mean why would you do that of course So upon investigation of the laptop, because, you know, the police um, immediately took that out and let it dry off and sent it right to the lab in a bucket of rice. Right. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So after they were able to investigate and pull the information off that laptop, it was discovered that David had used it to make several very incriminating Google searches. And now I'm going to read you a few of David Moffat's Google searches. By the way, guys, don't Google search things like this. No. You need to write, like, dear Mr. Google, this is just for research. I'm not actually doing this. Right. Exactly. As, like, the first half of your sentence. So the first one is the best murdering guide you'll ever need. Was that a book? I don't understand. Like, that's a very specific question. And. <laughs> I, I don't even know. Okay. I mean, I guess if that's what you're looking for, then sure. that's what you type like, is in. Is this a book? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Then the next one was how to get away with murder. Maybe he wanted to watch the show. <laughs> Did anybody think of that? The next one was hiring a hitman. That is not a show. <laughs> convicted crimes of passion in Polk County. So he wants to find out <laughs> who else has been convicted for this and I guess how much time they got. I like don't know. To find out who he's going to be <laughs> Bunk mates with? I don't understand. I guess, I guess he wants to see how this all goes down after you get caught. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. So the next one was love triangle murder. What? So he's <laughs> he's really invested in this I like whole that thing. he even <laughs> uses like the cutesy terms for love it. Triangle. Of passion, love right. triangle. Right. Yeah. So then he looked up traffic cameras and grimes. 
so he's really starting to go deep now. He wants to see. He, uh, he's really trying to plan his out and his right. alibi and everything. The next one, this one's really, really disturbing. He searched, how thick is the human skull? And there was another one that I didn't write in my notes, but he had also searched. Um, he wanted to know what fruits resembled the human skull the most. What? I don't know. All that's I, like pregnancy baby All stuff, I could think right? is that he was trying to like do practice shots at this thing. Mm-hmm. That's why, that's the only reason I could think why you would search oh. that. And that is just sickening i don't even have anything else to say about that no so then um then the next one and this is then when he starts coming to his senses he searches saint anthony confession times so now he wants to know you know just go confess now and, yeah and, why, why? and then don't do the murder when you're, yeah, when you're like this deep into your google searches like take a second <laughs> review your recently searched history before you go and kill somebody and right say, like, <laughs> your subconscious is trying to talk you out of this right and then finally his last one what does hell look like he googled search what does hell look like did he think there was going to be a map or like <laughs> pictures somebody posted on instagram like i don't understand where you're going with that bud he was concerned about it are you worried about the location or the temperature <laughs> i don't get i don't get why that matters in this at all if you think you're going there but oh my gosh that it's just nah. but it speaks so much to like the premeditation, absolutely yes. Absolutely, so much premeditation. This is not a crime of passion. Like, this is straight up first degree murder. Right, you're straight up look, searching and planning. Yeah, yeah. Planning it and trying to see how much you can get away with. And yeah. it's just very odd. I still think he was looking up the show on that one. I think that was about <laughs> when it came out. So the defense in this case attempted to paint David Moffat as mentally ill and had gone down a, da- a dark spiral when he learned of Justin and Angie's engagement. So because they worked in the same office, um, Justin and Dave, and in the same cubicle even, apparently whenever this news broke that Justin was engaged and every, you know, everyone in the office is congratulating him and, you know, everyone is so excited and happy for him and there's just this happiness in the office and this buzz going on. Um, And then whenever it finally got around to Dave that Justin was actually engaged to Angie, supposedly he just... Went crazy in love and lost his mind. and Crime of passion. Cri- well, at that moment, it would have been a crime of passion, but then he waited. Yeah. He so now waited. it's no longer a crime. Of- now you've had time to think about it, yeah. and you should have made a different decision at that right. point. So they claim that he didn't even know why he had done what he did. I have some ideas. The prosecution was having none of that and laid all the evidence out for a jury, proving that David had planned this murder down to the last detail and had even planned to frame someone else for it. David Moffat was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole, which which is the mandatory sentence for first-degree murder in Iowa. I assume there's no death penalty there. Must not be. So, Angie, I uh, you guys know me. I like to go down, down, you know, rabbit holes, and I like to go sleuthing on the internet and finding people, which is, sounds really creepy, but I promise I don't do anything weird. Um, so I did kind of try and find Angie and see if I could see where she was now. And We just want people to be happy. That's you know really what I, I mean? want. I just want to go and see, like, do they have a profile? Do they look happy? Do they seem like, Will they be you know, my friend? Can I? Right. <laughs> um, so I did find Angie, and it looks like she was just married in the summer of this year, 2017, and she looks like she's really happy from what I can tell um, from her account. So, of course, she has, you know, I found her new husband's name and everything, which I'm not going to share here. Um, but they did seem like they were really happy. And um, so that made me happy, like yeah. you said. I mean, it's, it doesn't replace the person that she lost. And, um, you know, I hope that she is still in touch with his family to some degree a little yeah. bit. Although that Even has to be so painful. It does. I know. That's just like a constant reminder, I would think. <laughs> I'm like, shut that door. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, yeah, but except... Ex- I get it. He I remembers. And But if it wasn't for the fact that his mom was also there that night, then maybe I would be a little yeah. easier to be like, I'm just going to close that book now yeah but i feel like i would i would i personally would feel like i had a duty to like stay in her life yeah t- t- on some level yeah you know i'm not saying she has to like be grandma to her children or anything yeah. but i would think that it would be nice to like at least meet up with her yeah. and have you know lunch or whatever well the interesting thing about the mom on this is she's like i said very straightforward just very non-emotional really like you would kind of expect someone to be and so what I loved is at the end of the dateline, they, for lack of a better word, really humanized her. And she was able to tell the story of Justin whenever he was growing up and how he went up on the roof and he would take his little G.I. Joe men and put them down, like at three years old, put them down the chimney of his neighbor's 
house. Yeah, like like parachute them at three years old on the top of a roof. Well, that's why I'm making the face I'm making. Yeah. <laughs> because why is a three-year-old on the roof? Well, because three-year-olds are crazy, man. <laughs> we have four-year-olds and they're insane. But yeah, I just loved, like, you could see her face light up whenever she talked about that. And you just have to think of how painful this has been. And there has to be survivor's guilt with this. Oh, yeah. You know, even though obviously he was the target, if they had done anything really too much, he could have taken them out as well but like what was his point like she'll be so traumatized she'll go back to him I didn't really like or he just or wanted to hurt I her think so it's bad. just anger and just you know just so much jealousy and just so much anger built up that he you know wasn't afforded this opportunity to be in her life like that and I yeah I just think it was just I think it's just a case of a person who's insane like wanting to but do not something actually insane because not this actually guy insane this. no he did but one thing we didn't You have touch- some level of insanity, though. Yeah. One thing we didn't touch on was that sweatshirt that they found in the house. And that... Did you did you get this part? Did you see this? Um, that he actually... It was the boat registration. There was a boat registration in the pocket of that for a sex offender that was in the neighborhood's son. So he was just, like, trying to... To throw in throw all these... everybody. Uh-huh. Like, just throw everybody in on that. And I thought that was just... Great. Like, how is he getting that? I mean, obviously he broke in and took it, but it was just like that sweatshirt made no sense. And then you see like, oh, well, and why would you have a registration of right. a boat in it? But he just was so methodical. And I love more than anything in this, my hero in this story would be that one police officer that was like, I don't like this right. wreck thing and put it all together. Right. Just like really got the ball rolling, I thought. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I, the officers in that were on the Dateline, the way they described it too, like it was really. I can imagine. I mean, these are police officers, and they're sitting here saying like that they were like kind of nervous about this guy. That, yeah. You know, even though he wasn't really doing anything wrong, and you know, the one officer said he already had patted him down and knew that he wasn't armed or anything, but he still wasn't comfortable, like you know, transporting him anywhere or doing yeah. anything like that. So, I don't know. I can't imagine that. Yeah. Being a case, like I said, with, if a police officer doesn't want to be around you alone, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know something's You're something's wrong with you. Freaking somebody out. So, <laughs> so that was our episode on Justin Michael. We hope you guys enjoyed it, and we will. We don't have any um, on my Datelines this week. We didn't really push it. We not when we had the like host from Dateline, right? On last How week. are you going to top that? Yeah, so we, we can't. So we'll be back at um, on my Datelines next week. If you guys want to send them to us, you can email them uh, momsandmurder at gmail or course if you want to join our lovely facebook group mums the word we've got a lot going on in there right now um especially with our christmas family that we have Mm -hmm. um we had already named one christmas family and it was super super successful everything on her list was purchased we chose a second name and we are really excited about that so we're going to have a second family in there if you want to have an opportunity to get a to help a family get some gifts for Christmas, then you should join us in our group and come to see what we're all about in there. Yeah, it's just gifts of chickens and, right. and all kinds of stuff <laughs> all the time. So um, have a great week, and we will be back with you guys next week. Bye. Hey, my name's Paul, and I'm not an animal expert. I'm Donna, and I'm not an animal expert either. And together we do a podcast about animals called Varmints. Every week we pick an animal, do a bunch of research on it, and bring you some interesting facts about that animal. But we don't stop there. We talk about that animal in movies, TV, and other pop culture. And we talk about whether or not that animal would make a tasty dish, and how intelligent we think it is on the scale of 1 to 10. It's exactly like one of those fancy PBS nature documentaries. Except with more poo jokes. New episodes go live every Thursday wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Or you can visit us at blazingcariboustudios.com. <laughs> Varmints! Varmints! <laughs> Hi, Hi guys. guys! You're listening to the Mums and Murder podcast, and we're from the Young Free and Couple podcast. My name's Shamika. And my name is Issa, and we're a young British couple. We talk about social issues. We have lots of fun. We discuss parenthood, marriage, our relationship, how we home our kids. Issa, and why do you keep on leaving stuff hanging around? What's wrong? You, I just bumped my toe on your hammer. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll put it away next time. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll put it away next time. That's what you always say, and I always end up hurting myself. Gosh. What do you want me to do? It's happened what do you mean, already. What do I want you to do? Do you, you realise that this is a Mums and Murders podcast? I am a mum. You better mind I don't...
Okay, well, why don't you just be careful because you're waving it in my face and you're going to hit me. If I wanted to hit you, I would do this. Issa? Issa? Guys, I really need to go. Don't forget, we're the Young Free and Couple podcast. You can check us out on Apple Podcasts and any other podcasting apps. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Moms and Murder podcast. Make sure to check back with us next week for a new episode. You can also find us at momsandmurder.com where you can connect with us via social media. Please make sure you subscribe and give us five stars because giving us four stars would be a crime. Thanks so much.